Okay, well, first of all, just want to remind you of a couple of very important things. This is the week that we finish up this unit, okay? So we will be uh, doing that today, and then Thursday we have a review in class, all right? And then next Tuesday is the first exam, and there's a description of it here. On Thursday we can talk about the mechanics of the exam. But do keep that in mind, and just remember that for that exam you have to bring that pencil to do the Scantrons with. And I wanted to show you where you can find some important material if you haven't already. Go to Files and Content, and then to Modules. And in this module here, you'll find that updated study guide. Of course, the syllabus. And I just uploaded this thing, which you'll want to take a look at. Notes on Athenian leaders mentioned in the Gorgias. Okay, we're going to talk about that today. But this gives you a little bit more information about each of them. Okay? So, you've got all your other things there. You've got pointers for the first exam, which I'll be using on Thursday. But if you want, you can take a look at that ahead of time. The parallels for Plato. That's going to be required reading, so you've probably already read that, but be aware. Um, and you've got the information on Confucius. And also down here you have one of the two required videos for the course available online that you can watch or, or watch again. Uh, also, my GTA will be sending you an email pretty soon, either today or tomorrow, letting you know when she'll be re-showing both of those videos uh, probably from 3 to 5 on Thursday or Friday. So you'll be getting that message soon. Okay? Okay, and another thing I wanted to mention, just to kind of give you a heads up, these are the two books for our next unit. So if you don't have them, get them. There's a lot of different copies, especially of The Art of War. <coughs> Uh, but I really recommend this one, which is really cheap, and hopefully the bookstore has it. It's, it's a Dover edition. It costs $4.95, or at least it's supposed to. And the nice thing about this edition of The Art of War is that it doesn't have tons of other annotated material in it. It's got some. But some of the Art of War books can be about this thick, and 90% of them are commentary commentary that's spliced into Sun Tzu's commentary. So this cuts down on that considerably so that you're just reading Sun Tzu. So hopefully you have that already. And uh, of course Machiavelli's Prince. Okay? So any questions before I go ahead and get started with this last this last set of material here? Okay. Come on Thursday with your study guide and your notes and any questions that you have. All right. Okay. Well, you remember last time we left off, we've completed the discussion of, of the argument between Socrates and Callicles. And I think we left off last time talking about how Callicles sees Socrates as unmanly. He sees him as unmanly because he's not a man of the world, he's not a general, he's not a businessman. And you know that Socrates eventually shot back and said, somebody like Callicles is unmanly because he and people like him spend their whole lives trying to defend themselves. And referring back to the rhetoricians, Okay, saying that they pander to people, they spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to flatter people. So they're not really their own men after all. They don't have that independence that would come from stepping back from that and just doing what they want to do and, and, and taking chances. So it, Socrates ends up telling Callicles that in fact he's cowardly, that he's, that he's driven by fear of what other people will do to him. And that's a criticism of the general philosophy of Callicles more than it is probably of that specific person. Because I think as I pointed out before, we don't even know if Callicles is a rhetorician. He doesn't actually discuss rhetoric per se all that much. He's uh, advocating a philosophy of uh, dog eat dog, eat or be eaten. You know, 
and he says the successful man, the one who's worthy, is the one who's able to be on top of that. Okay, well that leads to this discussion of actual Athenian leaders. Okay, so this discussion of actual Athenian leaders uh, that are admired by people uh, comes after the discussion about courage and cowardliness and what the best type of life is. And uh, Socrates at this point is pretty much holding that dialogue with himself. He's not getting a lot of responses, so he's, he's telling Callicles and the others what he thinks. And this is his chance to provide commentary directly on what has happened and is happening in Athens, which is something they've danced around throughout the dialogue. And it's in the back of people's minds, so to speak, but there hasn't been that much discussion of, of the reality of it, of, of the details of it. So Socrates asks Callicles, have any of our Athenian leaders ever improved our citizens? Okay. And Callicles does say, I can't think of any right now, but there are some great leaders from the Athenian past. And he, he names uh, some of these that everybody would have known these names. These would be like the George Washington and the Abraham Lincolns of, of Athens, okay? Um, and the reason why I gave you that sheet is so that you could, let me just end this for a second and I'll come back, so that you could kind of know who these people are, okay? Uh, what they all have in common is that they tried somehow to expand their own power and Athenian power, but the results weren't good for themselves or for Athens or both. So, for instance, Cimon, who was uh, an Athenian general, he helped expand Athenian power after the Greeks defeated the Persians, led a successful attack against the Persians, so he was a uh, military hero of sorts. But then he made a mistake. Spart Sparta called on him to help put down their slave uprising. They had a huge slave population called the Helots. Uh, whom they had to control and try, it was their number one problem. The reason why the Spartans couldn't expand past a certain point was because they had such trouble with their own slaves. And at that time, Athens and Sparta were allies, and so they called on Athens to help. He went, but he couldn't help. He was ineffective. And because of that, even though he had been a war hero, you might say, okay, um, he was actually ostracized and exiled from Athens for 10 years. So, you know, when Socrates talks about these people, he says, if they were successful, if they really knew how to lead, would they have come on these hard times? And would they have gotten to the point where they were so unpopular with, with these people that they actually would exile them or, or kill them? So, uh, he did come back and he led the aristocratic party for a time against democratic reforms. So he was not a, a, a proponent of democracy, but he was a consistent proponent of expansion and naval power. Um, Miltiades was his father, and he's mentioned as well. He became a powerful Athenian general. He showed tyrannical tendencies uh, in his career. Uh, and probably would have loved to have ruled over Athens in that capacity. But when he went up against the Persians, he was defeated. And because of this, and this was a common thing to happen to these generals, they would, uh, they would be unsuccessful militarily. There would be no evidence that they actually collaborated with the enemy, and yet they would be accused of doing so. Their, their defeat made them unpopular, and therefore and then their enemies began to spread rumors and allegations that they were... Uh, unfaithful to Athens, and that's why they lost. And that's what happened to him. He was sentenced to death for treason, uh, but his, con his sentence was confer converted to a huge fine, which he couldn't pay. And he ended up, he, had a, he went into jail with a war wound, and he died of his wounds. So another not too great end for a very, you know, somebody who later on was admired by the Athenians. His reputation was rehabilitated, which is why uh, Callicles mentions him now. And then we have Themistocles, who was a very much a Democrat. Okay? And he came to power around the time after the Persian War, when the Persians had been defeated. 
And his argument was, now, because we have played such a central role in defeating the Persians, we need to become the number one naval power in Greece. We need to uh, begin to think about not sharing power with Sparta. Okay? And so he advocated rebuilding the walls around Athens and down to the Piraeus where they could bring their ships and their goods through uh, between those walls so that they wouldn't be molested in doing so. He built up their military... And really, the Athenians would have Themistocles to thank for their, their great naval power uh, that they tried to use against the Spartans and against the uh, Sicilians later. But um, Themistocles was also accused of treason for conspiring against the Persians after he developed enough political enemies. Okay, So once again, he got to a point of power and popularity where he was on top and remember, that's the, that's the goal for the people Socrates is arguing with. But then because of those things, people began to fear and suspect him and be jealous of him and so forth. And so he too was exiled. He actually ended up working for the Persian king, so um, perhaps confirming people's suspicions. And then Pericles, we know the most about because you, you uh, learned quite a bit about him from the video, The Greeks. But Pericles was the most recent famous politician mentioned here in this dialogue. And Pericles was responsible for the beginning of the Peloponnesian War with Sparta. Okay? Pericles is the one who urged Athenians to be warlike and to um, believe that they could defeat Sparta and in doing so change the balance of power in Greece for good. Okay? And as long as he was alive, he had a fairly well thought out war strategy but his rhetoric did uh, tell people they could do whatever they wanted to do. And I think that Socrates blames Pericles for that rhetoric, which inflamed their ambitions and made them think yet again that they could do whatever they wanted to do. And of course, you know that after Pericles died of the plague, other politicians arose which urged all-out war with Sparta and the attack on Sicily. And when they went off to that other war, they lost both. They, they stretched themselves too thin. They didn't have the resources to back up the Sicilian expedition. They didn't think they would need to, uh, but they did, and this led to their utter defeat. Okay? So they got, at the end of all this history, the exact opposite of what they wanted and the exact opposite of what these politicians had told them they were going to get from all of the improvements in their military and the uh, expansion in the foreign policy that they advocated. So um, that's just to kind of give you the background as to why these guys are mentioned. Now, why does Callicles mention them as, er, as great people? Because in hindsight, okay, looking back, each of them tried to expand Athenian power. And some of them tried, like Themistocles and Pericles, to expand the democracy as well. And so looking back, even though people at different points in their careers hated them and did bad things to them, uh, as often happens, politicians look better after they're dead, <laughs> after, they've, after uh, their mistakes have been somewhat forgotten. Okay? So with that background, um, you can see a very different perspective between Callicles and Socrates on the value of these politicians. Okay? Um, actually, Socrates <coughs> believes that none of them improved Athens. Well, you can see in hindsight is 2020, right? Um, since he doesn't value that highly empire and power, he would not admire the attempt to gain it as much especially, though, uh, in light of the failure, of the ultimate failure of those designs. All right. But he mentions that if they were such great leaders, he says, why was it that each one of them, the citizens, rejected them at certain points in their career? Sometimes, as happened with Miltiades, causing his death. Or, as with Cimon, the, the exile, ostracism. Okay? Um, Pericles was fined for embezzlement. When people got tired of his war policy and didn't think it was working very well, they trumped up some charges to the effect that he was stealing from the Athenian coffers. Okay? And again, you have to realize there was no, this was a direct, absolute democracy. There was no procedural rights of any kind. You, know, you didn't have to prove your accusations at all. 
All you had to do is accuse and have enough people agree with you for whatever reason. So people didn't care about whether accusations were proved or not. So who knows whether Pericles or these other guys uh, were doing bad things. Okay. This was the environment in which uh, they tried to, to operate. Right. Remember that Socrates thinks that a leader is effective if they can lead rather than follow their constituents. Okay. The, the person who panders with rhetoric and has to try to figure out how to please the people, he doesn't admire. But as we discussed last time, he seems to be able to admire the, po the possible leader who can lead, who can bring the people along on to his point of view, but of course has to risk, risk not having their approval. All right. So his ultimate verdict of these politicians, these leaders, is that each one in their own way made Athens more idle and greedy, and that's because each of them in their own way wanted to expand Athenian power. And Athenian power came with more money and, and a lot more slaves, because as they expanded, they would uh, enslave the populations. They'd bring those slaves back to Athens and they would do their work. So uh, instead of the Athenians being productive, more and more their slave population was productive. And in, in addition to that being unjust for those who are enslaved, it's not good for the people. This is his point of view, for the people doing the enslaving. Also, he admits, each brought more wealth and empire. So Athens became wealthier and wealthier as it expanded. It gained access to all of the all of the trade at a favorable, you know, at, a, at an advantage with these people. It obtained tributes from all of these subject people. Okay, so they had to pay Athens. They had to usually dismantle their their naval power and then pay Athens a certain amount of money every year. Okay? So they brought all of that in, which made Athens a lot wealthier. They could build and do what they wanted to do, but again. Coming from Socrates' perspective, it's not good for people to obtain wealth, especially uh, not through their own work, but taking from others because, again, that makes them greedier. There's never an end to their desires. And you know that Socrates thinks that the worst fate is for a person to be enslaved to those desires. And each brought more democracy. Um, and Socrates is dubious about the value of democracy, as you probably know by now. Okay? Uh, not necessarily that he's advocating tyranny or aristocracy or any other type of system, but he does criticize democracy. This whole, this whole dialogue is about the flaws of democracy. So I suspect that, that Socrates does, would not prefer direct, absolute democracy because it brings about the type of manipulation and poor decision-making that you see in this type of history. Okay? Now, he didn't go on to develop a, an idea of a democracy that was better than that, uh, but future philosophers did. You know, Aristotle, for instance, Plato's student Aristotle, had the idea of polity in which you mix the power of the people with the power of the wealthy, and you, you, these two groups have to work together and compromise, and they balance each other. And he thought that was more practical and more likely to not end in either class warfare or civil war or some extreme uh, policy. But uh, just the fact that each of them in their own way, uh, either through their opposition and being unpopular to democracy or by promoting democracy, their influence increased uh, the amount of democracy in Athens. And that had poor results because people continue to be <coughs> manipulated by these politicians. Okay? All right. So, I'll leave that up for a second, but I've kind of already made those points. Um, Socrates' point of view about slavery and prisoners of war, you have to take by inference. He doesn't have a direct teaching on these issues, but he does seem to be critical of the of enslaving and of taking prisoners of war for enslavement. Okay. Um, he doesn't seem to think that it does a nation much good. All right.
Also, in having to keep the Allies down, Athens had to continue to be uh, have a powerful military force, which it could then use for other other things that it wanted to do. So it was always available to them. Uh, at a certain point, because of the number of so-called allies or tribute-paying subject states that they had, they couldn't afford to back down on their power because they were literally surrounded by people who would have attacked them if they saw a weakness. So, for instance, Pericles argued to the Athenians, your empire has become a tyranny, but you can't afford to back away from it now. You, you're compelled to defend it and to expand it because if you don't, the implication was these people will come against you. They'll find somebody to ally with, like Sparta or Persia, and they'll come against you. Okay? So, and remember, I'm just reminding you of this history, the most recent history that would have been surely on the minds of, of Socrates and the people that he's talking to and, and Plato who's writing this is that Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. Pericles urged them into that war, as I said, and the Athenians became trained to believe by their rhetoricians, by the politicians, that they were vastly militarily superior to all opponents. And they inflamed their desire for more wealth and more power. And so the big mistake that they made, just to repeat again, is that they were still fighting with a very powerful country, Sparta, when they decided that it would be easy and profitable for them to take Sicily as well. And Sicily being a long ways off in those terms of, of those days, they had to put out quite a fleet. And uh, those were ships that they could have used against Sparta, and they would have been better. They were at a point where they could have won that war. Okay? But instead, because of spreading themselves thin, they lost that war. And it was after that that Sparta basically insisted they had to take down their walls. They had to disassociate themselves from their allies. Um, and it became a period of decline as far as their military was concerned and their economy. But as the video pointed out, this was a period of time when the, when the intellectual life of Athens began to flourish. Okay. All right. Any questions about the, the, the commentary about past leaders and all of that? So just keep in mind all that history is back there. The, the, the dialogue is written in that context, so you need to know that. All right. The last thing I wanted to talk about is this myth that uh, Socrates tells at the end of the Gorgias. Now, up to this point, Socrates has given lots of reasons why a person should be just and self-controlled, and, sh and the usual practice of democratic rhetoric is, is a waste of time or not good for a person. Uh, but he hasn't really uh, relied upon non-this-worldly reasons. Okay. To a certain extent, he pointed in that direction. We remember our discussion of intangible benefits. When he starts to argue that more or less integrity is its own reward, that you're, if you're satisfied with your justice, you'll be a happy person, that those arguments began to move in this direction. Okay? Uh, but a lot of his arguments are this worldly based, uh, practical reasons. And so now at the end, though, we get this myth. And uh, one of the questions that, that always arises about this, and I think I discussed this in the textbook, is why does he think that he needs to, to have this myth here? And th this isn't the only dialogue that Plato wrote where there's a myth, uh, usually at the end. And the Republic has a different myth, a different type of myth. It has some similarities, but a lot of differences. Okay. Um, well, there's no one answer to that question, because we really don't know. Okay. Um, Perhaps it's simply his final defense, the last argument that he can throw at uh, this question of why should you do right even if people condemn you and it makes you unpopular, etc. Remember, that was a major issue for Socrates, a real challenge. 
uh, the Calicles in particular levels is uh, why should you, when you're not getting any worldly reward, when you're actually being punished for being a good person, why should you continue to do it? Okay? And really, uh, to a certain extent, there is no answer to that particular question under certain circumstances unless you turn to some other non-tangible, non-worldly reason. So perhaps um, this is, he considers, necessary uh, for answering fully that last question. He does say that he regards something like it as true. Okay? And he says that of other myths in other dialogues. He usually prefaces his telling of the myth by saying, I think that something like this might be true, or this is plausible, or perhaps worthy of, of belief, something like that. Okay? But yet we know that the myths vary. So he couldn't be saying that something specifically like this has to be true. Okay? But if we look at the essentials of the myth, we could perhaps argue that this is evidence that Socrates believed that something like this myth, having involving the afterlife and, and uh, justice in the afterlife, is worthy of belief. Can't be proven, okay? But might be reasonable to believe. Right? Another possibility that, that scholars have explored is, is the ultimate example of Socratic rhetoric, okay? Remember, Socrates says that the true orator would be one who instills justice and virtue in people's souls. Okay? And perhaps, especially in the context of, of ancient Athens or ancient Greece, uh, a particular kind of mythology might actually be a really good example of that type of rhetoric that instills justice in people's souls. All right. So let's take a look at the myth. Um, but those are questions for you to think about, about the purpose of it. All right. Well, in general, the message of the myth is that if you're a good person when you're alive, that you will gain rewards after death. So that's the, that's the main message. On the other hand, if you're a bad person, you're going to uh, gain punishments after death. Okay. So he's got this system which would be familiar to the Athenians, but not in its entirety, okay? Um, of there being two places that people could go after death, the islands of the blessed or Tartarus, which is also called Hades in this book, okay? All right? Now, it wouldn't be completely recognizable because Socrates expands the possibilities of people getting into the islands of the blessed. Because at this time, many people believed that only heroes and great men could ever achieve a status somewhat similar to the gods. Okay? And that everybody else went to a sort of dark and shady place after they died and didn't really have much of an existence. All right? So the fact that, that Socrates is saying a good person, regardless of who they are, could end up in the islands of the blessed it's a bit challenging to the typical point of view of the time, okay? Now, this is how this works. Um, after you're dead, you are stripped of all of your external uh, appearances. So, you, your, uh, your soul, all they see, all the gods see is your soul, right? And they sit in judgment of you and people are going by there's no clothes, there's no retinue, there's, you know, there's no mansion to look at. There's none of those things that could tell them whether you're, you've been a king or a slave or something in between. Okay? So all they can do is look at um, your soul and they examine whether there's scars on the soul. Okay? And remember this discussion earlier in the dialogue about the unjust soul is like a disease. Injustice is a disease of the soul. So this kind of echoes that perspective. So they can see whether your soul is diseased or has been diseased or not. Now, if you are an average person who's done some unjust things, okay, you're going to have to spend some time in Tartarus, but eventually you move to the islands of the blessed after you've been purged of your injustice. 
So those are the ones who are curable. All right? Sounds kind of like purgatory. Okay, the Catholic, Catholics have a similar notion of uh, in-between state, right? Well, that would be limbo. Anyway, so they move over to the islands of the blessed after a certain period of time when they're purged from their sins, okay? But then there are those who are so bad that they cannot be reformed, and they resist any reform. And those are the people who are incurable, and they stay in Tartarus forever. Right. So most people fall into those two categories. Right. And I'll just leave that up there for a second. I would say 98, 99% of the human race falls into those two categories. And probably 95% are curable. Okay? There's only a small number of people and they would be tyrannical types who would end up in Tartarus forever. Why? Well, you have to speculate why. Why would somebody be incurable? What, does anybody want to hazard a guess? Why, when faced with eternal punishment, would some people still be incurable and not able to reform? Mm -hmm. And just probably what they did during their life is probably so inhumane and probably so horrible that there's nothing that you can do to save them. Mm -hmm. So it may very well be that what they've done is just so horrible, it cannot be, they cannot recover from it, and it cannot be forgiven. That's one possibility. And it may be, I mean, he's talked about the soul being changed by, and more or less enslaved by desires. Possibly, possibly it's, it's impossible at a certain point to escape that enslavement. Uh, but for whatever reason, there, are, there will be some. Uh, and actually, this is a teaching that later Christian thinkers picked up on in Plato. It's interesting. There were certain teachings that they rejected, but certain teachings in Plato and Aristotle that they liked, and those were the ones that sounded kind of close to what they themselves believed. And this is, this is one of those places where they said, hmm, the pagans, they, they, even they knew uh, about heaven and hell and, and purgatory. So it's kind of interesting. Okay. But, okay, 98% or 99% of people are in one category, but then there are some people, he says, who go straight to the islands of the blessed. And who would they be? <laughs> the philosopher. Yeah, the philosopher. Why? <clears throat> because they hold the values that Socrates sees as most important. Mm -hmm. They don't have their pursuit is not in power but in knowledge, I guess, so that's right. it's pure in spirit. So all of their lives they've pursued knowledge and not power. They haven't done harm to others. He points this out. Um, and one thing to keep, keep in mind is Socrates thought that once one was a true philosopher and spent their lives trying to understand what justice is okay, and the good life, they would become incapable of doing any real harm. Now, that's really arguable, and, and I'm sure that you probably think this is a little self-serving on Socrates' part. You know? I'm in the category of those who will go to the islands of the blessed. You know? So, ha-ha, and boo-boo, right? <laughs> so, it's kind of difficult to take this without smiling a little bit. And, and we do know that, that people can... I mean, this is an insight that, that these people wouldn't have had as much as we do now, I think. But people can absolutely know, I would argue what right and wrong is, and still choose to do the wrong thing. Whereas Socrates really believed if you really understood what was right, you would become incapable of doing wrong. Okay. So, I mean, it's a difference of opinion, I guess. Uh, and of course, what, what constitutes really understanding what is right? You could always argue that the person who does wrong really doesn't understand what is right. However, um, the, the Judeo-Christian influence on the Western culture has 
this teaching that you can absolutely know what is right, but not do it. Okay, so that's an insight that um, that comes from a religious heritage. All right, but that's exactly what he says. He says the philosopher has stayed out of politics and done no harm. Um, one question that you might raise against this is: Is it good to stay out of politics? We've mentioned this several times. You know, is this is this the correct moral position? Yes, it keeps the philosopher from being having his hands sullied by political compromises and having to deal with unsavory people, but is that really the responsible position to take, to stay out of politics? Okay. Um, it's safe, and I guess Socrates would argue he can influence politics indirectly by whom he talks to and the teachings he tries to get out, but you could certainly see the, uh, the other side, that perhaps you know, it's, a, it's a detriment to the people if a good person who means well doesn't get in politics and try uh, to use their knowledge for the well-being of other people, which would involve learning the arts of politics, okay? learning rhetoric, um, understanding uh, political strategy. Okay? Uh, so when we get to Machiavelli, we're going to see a very strong argument that uh, in order to do positive things for people, you have to make moral compromises in politics. You have to get involved. Um, so anyway, uh, Socrates' last uh, statement to Callicles is, when that judgment comes, Callicles, rhetoric will be of no use to you. All right? So I guess that's the the ultimate rejoinder from Socrates. You can talk all you want, they aren't even going to hear it. They're not listening. Um, it, all they're doing is looking at what you've actually done. All right. So again, there's lots of reasons. Some, some commentators say you could chop that myth right off the end of this dialogue and you'd still have a complete dialogue. Okay. They say it's not really needed. We could see it as a supplement to his teaching, not essential, but still a supplement, understanding that many people have religious beliefs like this in, in the Greek world and wanting to shape those beliefs. And I think that's a really plausible argument because um, Socrates was very critical of what people learned about the gods in his day, clearly, uh, from what he said in this and other dialogues. He didn't like the way people were taught. The guys doing all these immoral things, murdering each other, killing people, um, having relationships with human beings, popping out babies left and right. Okay, um, So <laughs> possibly he needed to get, he's trying to get that alternative mythology out there, which he thinks reflects moral reality better than the, than the typical mythology that people were being taught. It may also be an indicator that he actually values traditional beliefs. He does want to change them a little bit, but that he understands that a lot of the glue that holds society together and keeps people honest is, is religious beliefs. Okay? That not everybody is a philosopher, but many people have religious beliefs. And this may be a nod in the direction of the usefulness to society of those beliefs if they're taught correctly. As I mentioned before, it may also be seen as good political rhetoric, right? And an acknowledgement that reason can't regulate most people's behavior. Okay. Um, so, take your pick. These are not mutually exclusive options, and you may come up with your own best guess as to why this is here. But I will say it's not a fluke, okay? Despite the fact that Plato has this reputation for being a rationalist, he frequently um, adds mythology to his writing. Okay. So take a look at this. Make sure you have that printed out. And are there any questions? Well, if not, I'm done. Okay, for this particular unit. So I'll see you on Thursday.